Today on this old house, it's tin knocking time here at the project, which means ductwork's going in. We bury a mold problem under four inches of concrete. They shouldn't have any more problems that they have. And today is roofing 101. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. This one right here is right on. Family that paints together stays together. Nice job. Where will a slab like this be used? The money's in the detail. That is beautiful. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house here in Newton, Massachusetts where we are working on this modest house that was built 125 years ago. Now one of the homeowners, Liz, she actually grew up in this house and she and her husband have asked us not to just renovate the home but also to add some extra space over a new garage so that Joe's parents can spend some time here. And when that happens we'll actually have three generations spending part of the year in this house. It's actually a very tall order given the fact that they're working on a tight budget. Hey, good morning, Roger. Good morning, Kev. And what are you working on? Oh, this tree we said was sick and should come down yeah. earlier. Still sick. <laughs> it didn't get any better. No, huh? not at all. So that's going to come down eventually? Yep. And we are going to build some stone walls out behind the garage nice. to hold in the banking. Yeah, because we actually cleared it out when we built that new structure right there. Right. And this is a beauty we tried to save, and we did. This is our birch tree. So how did we do? We fenced it off to protect it? It looks okay? Yeah, it looks okay. Couple things, though. With a new addition, some of these branches are actually resting and hitting on the roof. They have to be properly removed. Yep. Then see the three stems, see how this is starting to grow out? Yeah, I'm worried about it, maybe not now, but in the winter of it, just splitting and opening. So we want to take care of that. But you can fix all that and we can save this beauty? We can. That I love to hear. This season on this project, we are promoting the building trades as a viable career alternative. We call it Generation Next. And we have three apprentices who have been working all over this house, although a lot of what they've been working on has been renovating our front porch. And even though we've got a lot of work out front there, this front room right here, well, not a lot changes. The big changes happen once you come into this space. And you can see that the wall here between the old dining room and the new kitchen has come down. That really opens up things, as well as the views to the new family room. Hey, Richard. Hey, how are you? All right, how are you? Good. So how are we doing with plumbing? Plumbing, awesome. We got uh, all the rough waste and water. We got for our new bathroom, our kitchen, we're good to go. We connected on to the old bathroom here. Everything's there, we're inspected. Love to hear it. Boiler got delivered the other day. Water heater's on site, not quite connected. And today we're breaking the back of the air conditioning system doing proper duct work. Oh, wow. Can you save some of that for us? Be glad to. All right, thank see you. See you a little bit. So a lot of work going on inside, but also a ton of work going on on the outside of this house. We are at the roofing phase of this project, and Tommy is passionate about keeping these houses dry. Hey, Tommy. Yeah. Is that passion for a dry house about to rub off onto the apprentices? Yeah, roofing 101 today. We're going to see what they know. All right, I'll leave you to it. Okay. See you later. Yep. Sweet. All right, so this is a self-sealing membrane right here. There's a couple of different types out there. This one has a granule on it. That allows you to walk on it, but it also allows it to stay out in the sun a little longer. We like to run it over and up the wall so it's added protection as a flashing, but it still has to be flashed. Now, in areas where you get heavy snow, it's important that you bring a self-sealing membrane from the roof down onto the fascia board, sealing that gap. Now let's talk about flashing. This is actually a drip edge. The first big problem that I see roofers do a lot of is they take the drip edge and they gently put it against the fascia board and then they nail it. Then they take their shingles and they put them on top and they make it flush with the edge here. Those are two no-nos. I'm just going to tack it. Again, I'm going to do it wrong, so I'm going to place it flush with the edge. Okay, so now you can see that it's all flush with the edge and the drip edge is touching the fascia board. Now, depending on wind and rain conditions, when the water runs down the roof, let's watch what happens as it comes to here. Now, with driving rain, the water is going to run right off the roof. See? But when it starts to slow down, see what happens? 
See how it's sticking, going right under and hitting that drip edge right there? Yeah. Getting pulled right in. That's surface tension, pulling the water against the surface. The bubbles will grab the fascia board, run down the fascia board, and shorten the life of it. So that's a no-no. All right, let me show you the way I like to do it. First of all, we're gonna take the drip edge and slide it out, keeping, the, keeping it tight to the roof. I'm gonna slide it out enough so I can put my fingers in there. Okay, pull my fingers out and I have a space. All right, so what I wanna do is we wanna nail it. We'll kind of keep the nail about in the center right here. That keeps our flashing laying flat. And nail it about every 16 inches. All right, this is an architectural shingle. There are also what is called three tab shingles where there's th two slots for individual tabs. Architectural shingles are spaced a little different as they go up the roof. This manufacturer makes a starter course. The starter course has this tar right here. It's activated by heat. I don't want the joints to line up, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take and cut something off of this. Okay, lay it down, put it on the roof with the sticky side down. I'm gonna place it, bring it in, so it just touches my flashing, and I'm gonna pull it down a half an inch. Now I'm gonna take another starter again, flip it upside down. Now what I wanna do is I wanna gently bring it against that shingle. I wanna eyeball it so that it's even. Tack it. How low, right Make here? Make it flat. That's good, yep. And one more right here. Make sure the nail is down tight and flat. Okay. And the next thing I need to do is add another piece of flashing right here on top of the courses as we go, and that's called step flashing. I'm gonna nail it high. Okay, now we're ready to start our coursing as we go up. And I only need one nail. Now we take the next shingle that we cut, lay it in place, small piece of shingle. Okay, so now we're getting our next shingle. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial free. Watch it all in the This Old House app and join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Okay, so now let's see what happens when we pour the water on the edge of the roof when it's away and overhung. Ready? Yep. So you can see how the water is just going right away and falling off of the edge. It's not being sucked down around. All right, guys, did you learn anything? Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right, good. So I want you to get this roof done, and I'll come back later and check on you. cause of the mold was a concrete slab that didn't have any vapor barrier. So our mason Mark McCullough and his crew are going to solve that for us today. Hey, good morning, Mark. Hey, Kevin. So uh, they had put down wood framing all over the old concrete floor. Tons of moisture came up and we got tons of mold and that's a problem. That is a big problem. So what we're going to do to rectify that is we're actually going to pour a slab on top of the floor. Okay. So and we're not going to forget our vapor barrier this time. That's what you that's what the plastic is. Right. So you can see that. And so what's the thickness of this? That's a thick six mil. Okay. Yeah, and that'll create a nice vapor barrier. I laid down everywhere and I even see that you came up 
the wall a few inches um, all the way around the perimeter. That's right. We wanted to make sure we had great coverage, so that's why we brought it up all the way. And then what's your formula here? You got sand down on top of this? That's right. This sand is actually going to help the concrete set up once we do the pour. So okay. the sand will absorb any moisture, any water that's excess. Beautiful. Yeah. And then you guys are working on the perimeter around there. What's going on? That's right. That is just a foam material that we're going to put all the way around the perimeter of the foundation. Gotcha. And that will allow for expansion, contraction. All right, let's get to it. What's next? All right, well, Kristen and I are going to start throwing the sand down, and then we'll throw the wire, and then we're ready for concrete. Mark's apprentice Kristen is part of our Generation Next initiative. This old house and the Micro Works Foundation are promoting the building trades as a viable alternative to college for thousands of people. Kristen has worked with Mark for over a year, and she took an unusual path to masonry. I always enjoyed building things when I was younger. It's just being able to do it in real life as a job is kind of a dream. So how did you get into masonry? Sitting behind a desk isn't for me. I learned that the hard way. Went into the medical field in the office for a year and just wanted to be outside and building, and here I am. Didn't like being behind a desk? No. Just wasn't me. Tell me about what you're doing day to day. I started off laboring, uh, which is pretty much tending to the masons, bringing them all their material, their mortar, brick, block, etc. And then um, that's hard work, right? Yes, it is. And then eventually, jumping on the wall, the, the masons help me. They teach me everything and kind of the basics, how to read a level, laying it straight. What do you like about the brick and the block? I like that it actually takes a little bit of skill to be able to lay it. You can't just throw it down and expect it to be perfectly straight, plumb and range. Mm -hmm. So it takes a little skill to be able to do that. See the wire? Get a hook. Make sure you pull that wire up into the middle of the floor. It's going to help with the reinforcement. And just make sure you do it all over the floor. What do people say when you say, I'm a mason? A little bit shocked. They don't, I don't think they really believe me at first. I... And they don't believe you because you're a woman, they don't believe you because you're young, they don't believe you because anyone's a mason. I think it's a little of all, a little, little of everything. I think being a woman is a big change being in the masonry field. But you're doing it anyway? Yes. Do you think there's a stigma about going into the trades? Um, yeah, I believe right now everyone's thinking going to college is to get a better career. But you don't have to have a desk job to make money, to be happy. So Mark, I'd say you're lucky to have Kristen working on your team, right? Well, we sure are. As, uh, as you can see, she gets right at it when she comes in, so that's all we're looking for. So what are her prospects, or I guess anyone um, like her's prospects in your company, in your profession? Well, lucky enough, we have Endless Brick, not only in Boston, but all over the country. So uh, oh, our prospects are very good, yeah. That's awesome. All right. So we have got a new slab going down with a vapor barrier. That should solve the problem. So that will eliminate the moisture problem. Uh, anytime they frame on this floor now, they're going to use pressure treated. Again, we've put that vapor barrier down, so they shouldn't have any more problems that they had before. All right. Finish the pour today. Walk on it tomorrow. You got it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> There are a lot of options for railings, and here at our Idea House in Rhode Island, our builder wants to make a big statement with this main staircase. So he's actually building a railing system that was a favorite of Thomas Jefferson. This is Jeff Sweener's workshop, and the railings he's making for us are called Chippendale, named for the famous cabinet maker Thomas Chippendale. It's also a railing system that was used by Thomas Jefferson on his house in Monticello, and we're hoping that they are going to make a big statement for us. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Kevin, how are you? All right, nice shop you. you've got here, Thank huh? You. This is great. So yeah. Chippendale today, huh? You Chippendale. Know, when I look at this design, it actually feels very contemporary, yeah. um, even though it's got a much older history. Yeah, sure does. It uh, came to ancient Chinese history, and uh, it was brought to England by Thomas Chippendale, a cabinet maker. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he sort of modernized the patterns and uh, 
and we think it's going to make a great statement in our idea house. And let's talk about the pattern because it's sort of like you know, what makes a Chippendale a Chippendale. I mean, you see these very distinctive rectangular shapes. Correct. Yeah, everything works off of the center. So you have a, a diagonal cross in the center, and then everything works outboard of that. And as you say, on those diagonals, whereas normally we're doing these balustrade and they're either vertical or horizontal, but not right. in this case. Correct. So everything how did you lay all this out? So we've start, uh, with a, with, we laid it all out on cardboard. So you're doing this by hand? We did it by hand. Wow, yeah. OK. So we've got a post-to-post a -post measurement. So at the house, we've set our newel post, one here and one here. Yeah. We take our measurement, and then we transfer the whole thing onto the cardboard. So that way, we can get the layout correct. And then we can see that there is a perimeter frame, which we saw built over exactly. there. And then you literally start with these diagonals. Yeah. The first piece, the most important piece, is the, is the main cross. Okay. And the way that is fastened is with a half lap joint. So that gives it this, the railing strength, and then it gives us a point of attachment for all of the repeating legs. And that's when the infill starts? Correct. So what have you got here for infill? Yep. So we've got all the different pieces. I labeled them so that we can put them in. I've got a C right here. We've got a D. Uh, yeah, check that out. Uh, and a B. Look at that. So you got more of these to do? Yep. Okay, we're going to start with the small one first. That's the right one. So you just left these long. We left them long, and then we'll trim the, the whole assembly off in the table saw. Okay. This one coming in. All right, now we need to cut the overhangs off. So what we've done is we've cut a piece of three-quarter inch plywood that fits exactly in our frame. And then we're going to mount temporarily the, the railing to it. And that's going to act as our sled. So that way we can run it through the table saw to trim off the edges. Nice. Look at that. And we're going to dry fit it first. It's going to be snug. It, is. it goes that pretty nice, though, huh? Sure, doesn't it? That's awesome. So we can blind fasten all of these into this subrail. Nice. Let's right. get it to the house. And this is going to go on this. Horizontal balcony section. All right. I got some blocks in there to set it on temporarily. It's good though. Nice fit. All right. Sharp. Look at that, huh? So how we're going to finish it is we've got rail cap plowed out. Yep. The rail cap's going to fit over that sub rail. Yep. Tie right into there, and then we've got a decorative cap that matches the profile of this rail. It's going to go around it. Beautiful. So that's the horizontal section. Now the vertical section, we've got to set two newel posts, and then we're going to build the same panel on the same slope as the stairs. Wow. And then is this going to be painted off for finish? It's going to be painted. Well, if you were looking to make a statement, you're going to make one. All right. That thing is beautiful. brand new HVAC system is going in. The heart of it is down here in the basement, Richard. And uh, for the first time in a while, just the old traditional ductwork. Right. You know, we see nowadays more and more people using the flex and assembly like on a rector set. This is the classic way it's always been done. Perfectly installed ductwork. Uh, you can see here a supply going out. Here's the return coming back to our air handler. Not our small ones. We've got plenty of room That's right. um, in this house to That's put right. this stuff in. But the way it comes to us is not as assembled duct. It comes the way it's always come, which is in two halves. This is a, a, either rectangular or square, mm. and those pieces will join together. And then there's a series of tools to shape metals. You know, this would be a little break to be able to bend in a clean way. Uh, these, there's all kinds of shears, left and right shears for cutting it. This is for crimping, if I needed to put an edge like this to crimp a round duct. Yeah. Okay, and then all kinds of methods for connecting it. And I thought Obi and Sarah could show us how it's done. Each piece has a male and a female. You have to just get the male lined up and then snap it in. He's got the little hammer going. And that's why they call it tin knocking. All right, so now he has to notch all four corners so we can prepare the metal to actually allow it to mate 
to another piece of ductwork. Now, using a tool called the brake, he can actually bend that piece of metal in a clean, beautiful, straight line back on itself. And now he has to do the same thing on the direct opposite side. So on the unbent pieces of metal, we, next thing we install is an S-clip. You can see one on each side. And that's going to allow the male piece, the straight piece, from the next piece of ductwork to key right in to, to that S-clip. So sometimes these don't go in this well. So, Obi, show the tool to just roll those together so you can now bring, it gives you a little leverage. You know, if you had a long piece of duct, you wouldn't be able to get it in. And now there's a thing called a drive cleat. And you can see that it's bent in such a way that there's a perfect place for both of these uh, bent pieces. And it protrudes over. And then you can bend it down. Go ahead. Okay. Now we got to do the same on the other side. got to put zip screws on all four corners. Yep. So now we've got a connection, but it's not tight enough. You know, it's not going to pull apart right now, but it's not tight enough to hold back air. So we've got to seal all the longitudinal seams and everywhere we butted two pieces together. And for this, we're going to use mastic tape. That really sticks on beautiful. And for the butt seams, we're going to use a special elastomer mastic. Now this, you want to be liberal with it and just creating a rubberized seal. You know, it can be messy, but it's the most effective by far for all those little cracks and seams. All right, so it goes on gooey and it hardens, but it still stays rubberized, so it, it keeps a tight seal. It doesn't flake off afterwards. So we've sealed all the longitudinal seams. We put a little tape even over that wet mastic, but now we're not done yet. We still have to insulate. All right, so this is a two-inch insulation. Okay, you want to pull it so it's snug. I got it here. Okay. And we've essentially fiberglass on one side, foil on the out. That's right. Okay. And then he's going to staple it. Hmm. You're trying to get all the fiberglass. Yeah, that folds it sort of in on himself. Yeah. This is an acquired skill. All right, so OB, that finishes that one just about. Why is the insulation important? Uh, that keeps the heat or the cooling inside of the ducts. So make sure to distribute in the right place, so not inside of the attic or in the basement. The money you paid for stays in the duct, right? <laughs> all right. Terrific. All right, what do you got left to do here? Uh, after we do this duct work, the so last piece there, we still want to handle it in in the garage yeah. and the condensers outside and then perfect we, well great go. great job nice oh, well. job Obi. thank you sarah thanks sarah thank you. so what have you got uh, for us next time richard uh next week actually we're going to run some gas piping with a new connection that doesn't have any threats i like that and you know our apprentices they're going to get a window lesson from tommy as we uh, replace all the old windows cool all right so until then i'm kevin o'connor i'm richard Thewitt for this old house Next time on This Old House. The exterior of our house is clapboards on the first floor and it's gonna be shingles on the second floor. And our architect has called for a flare detail to separate those two. This tool takes the drudge work out of gas piping. That's not going anywhere. And our new carpenters learn new window replacement. That's next time on This Old House. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.